Hello, welcome to Toby TV. This is the Toby TV Everson podcast. It's another edition, another edition of Ned Camp podcast with Cameron from the Mighty Blues. How are you, Cameron? Yeah, I'm good, mate. I'm good. How about yourself? I'm I'm better to be honest. It's been a bit of a whirlwind of 48 hours. Yeah. We normally um we normally start off with the the fixture just being and talk a bit about the fixture coming up. But to be honest, there's a massive elephant in the room, <laughs> and it's been. If this was a normal week, then it'd be we'd be fine talking about Tottenham. But I don't really think anyone's bothered because yeah. it's not the Premier League fixtures now, especially Tottenham and Arsenal this week. They've not become not irrelevant, but completely overshadowed by the absolute mess that is football. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, well, we'll get into that later. But let's just pretend that it has been a normal past few days, <laughs> and we'll, we'll just touch on Tottenham. So. Friday night, the team news come. The team news comes out. Was you shocked with the team news? I was shocked when I saw Iwobi and Coleman dropped it. In the end, I thought Coleman came in on, came coming on fresh uh, in the second half was all right. To be honest, may have benefited us. But what was your, what was your thoughts when you when you first saw the lineup? Um, in terms of the formation, and I sort of expected it. I knew we'd go with, yeah. with sort of a five at the back, and I don't like it, and I don't think we can play it. And I think two mistakes on Friday night showed that the, the defenders that play yeah. in that five at the back are uncomfortable. Um, I was I was shocked to see a Wobi, but I wasn't too shocked to not see Seamus Coleman. Only on mm-hmm. the basis of that, you know, for the last couple of years now, it's been a very similar situation with Seamus, and that's he comes in, he has two or three really really good games, but it's not. He's not taken out because he's dropped because he has another good game. He's taken out because he probably hasn't got the stamina to go yeah, again exactly. for another 90 minutes. So I wasn't massively shocked to see Seamus Coleman not in the starting eleven. Um, obviously, he come off the bench and had, a, a, had an impact, and he's been brilliant the last couple of games. Um, but I was just happy to see Alan back, uh, James Rodriguez in there. Um, you know, obviously, again, I'm not a big fan of the back five, but I understand Carlo Ancelotti seems to like it at the moment, maybe because of the attacking style it gives us. Obviously, uh, Jordan Pickford was back in the team as well. Um, and I thought those three players I've just mentioned, James, Alan, and well, Pickford didn't have to do much. I don't think he's playing for either goal, but Alan was, was fantastic. He was the Alan yeah. before his injury. It was the Alan that we brought in in the summer who'd come in and, and was absolutely everywhere. He looked like he was back to 100%. I yeah. had a bit of a concern about Alan after he'd returned from his two or three month mm. injury because I thought he seems like he's being rushed in here a little bit and I thought he was asked to do the core age role a little bit as well. Um, yeah. Whereas on Friday, he seemed like he was just in his own little role. He had Davis next to him. He had Sigurdsson and Hammers there to, to cover him going forward. So he just had to do what what we know he can do and he was he was brilliant. Hammers Rodriguez, again, back to 100% was everywhere. So you're right, it, it, it's mad to talk about because I was sitting here on Monday talking about it and you sort of sitting there and my emotion on Friday night was, you know, that's another uh, drop, two drop points there in, in a race for Europe and Tottenham are the team that are in seventh, Tottenham are the team that Everton should be leapfrogging tonight. And look, listen, we the reason we didn't win that game was because of us. Tottenham had nothing. They had, yeah. Other than the two chances we gifted them and we gifted them to arguably the best striker on the planet, they had nothing. Nothing at all. Well, so I, I think they had three shots on target, didn't they? Two of them were K left completely unmatched in the box, and they were exactly two goals in the in, in the six yard box. They're leaving, yeah. you know, the most clinical striker in the Premier League with that yeah. much room. Um, so on Friday night, I was sort of thinking we've had the chance to leapfrog Tottenham here. Uh, we could, you know, we, we could have been in the driver's seat. It's a missed opportunity, and then all of a sudden on Sunday night, I'm thinking, well, are we going to play in the Champions League next yeah. season? Did the Tottenham game really matter that much? Does the Arsenal game on on Friday really matter that much? So you're right, it's all been a bit of a whirlwind, and, and I feel like I've woken up today and checked social media and just been like, did anything? Of the, did, was I just dreaming then for the past 48 hours? Did any of that actually happen? Because it's gone from one extreme to another extreme yeah. to now sort of everyone being like, yeah, everything's sound again, back to normal. Well, it's not back to normal, is it? And I'm sure we'll talk about it in a minute. But no, in, in terms of the game, yeah, I, I was shocked to see a Wobie in the right wing back position because it's not as natural position. But then mm. again, what is? Um, but the I bench. just think, yeah, yeah, that maybe it's right wing back for somebody else, not not for Everton. But yeah. it was frustrating, and maybe because it's another game where we've ultimately we've thrown it through our own mistakes and, and also through missed opportunities that. Josh King, Richardson in the second half. Hammers had one in the first half. If you want to be particular, um, so it was it was a better performance. That's one thing I would say. If we're going to take the positives. We were a lot better than we were against Brighton. We actually stepped up. We pressed them. We put yeah. them on the toes a little bit. Well, we came out looking sharp, didn't we? We were running round, and all the players were definitely up for it. I think the only player, the only player I was let down with really was a uh, 
was he will be. I just, I just don't understand how. I mean, Col- Seamus Coleman is our best winger. Let's be honest. Yeah. And he's a thirty-three-year-old right back because I just saw this. He came on after a minute and he completely showed he will be. He put the ball into his feet, got it out of his feet. Yeah. And, Sprinted down the wing, put a ball in the box. You give it to Obi. He takes three touches before he decides where he wants to go. Yeah. He's, he's 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 far too slow, on it and he's. I think his decision making is shocking. So, yeah. I don't know whether he's one we'll be looking to get out of the club in this in the this summer or the next summer or January transfer window. But yeah, so I suppose that's I thought I suppose Seamus Coleman coming on highlighting how much we need a, a, a right winger. You know. Yeah. Coming on and showing no Obi up in one and a half minute. And showing he's our best winger that we've got is it's not a dig on Coleman because we love Seamus Coleman, but he should not be our best winger, should he? And yeah, you mentioned Alan there; he came out looking sharp. I was I'm, I'm happy to have him back. To be honest, he's a a brilliant asset. And another player who in, impressed me was was Gilfie Sigurdsson. I'd, I would I wouldn't really expect him to start if I'm honest before the game. I'd I would have liked to see to see King in there, but I wouldn't expect him to start either. Um, but I'm I'm. Surprise, Gilfie came on and I thought he had his best game of the season, to be honest. He, yeah. I think his second goal when he arrived in the box was, uh, was brilliant. And a player that let me down, sort of, was with Charleston. I think his his, his finisher wasn't great. The, the first chance he had on goal when uh, I think it was Roden stepped out of the, out of the line yeah. and he got it in the channel. And he just he just panics and shot too early. But listen, he needs a goal. And he had a chance in the second half where he just... Blaze it over the crossbar and I think it, he needs to calm down. So, what do you think it is with Charles? And you think it's a confidence thing? We've mentioned to Charles before, but I just think he's having a really awful season. Um, yeah, I think it's it's very much about. To be honest, I think he's not had the greatest of seasons, um, which is clearly affecting him. Look, Richarlison, I've never understood this, and it's not it's not every fan, and it's it's only a minority. But I've never yeah. understood this that Richarlison has the attitude that he doesn't care, he's not interested, because I think that lad cares more than most, and that's why sometimes yeah. you see him frustrated, and sometimes you see him angry and punching the floor. That's why he's trying to take free kicks off people because he wants to get involved. He wants to be, you know, he, he loves putting pictures on social media after games yeah. why they're opposition fans. Up. He loves the pigeon celebration. He loves all of that, and he loves helping this team, um, you know, succeed. And and look, I think with Richardson at the moment is <clears throat> he has wanted to play as a striker for quite a long, long time. Richardson hasn't made it quiet in, in stating that you know he prefers to play up front. Um, obviously he had that partnership with Dominic Calvert Lewin towards the back yeah. end of last season, both scoring goals frequently. And Richardson was, you know, you could argue our most important player in those last nine games because he was constantly popping up scoring. I think what's happened with Richardson is when he's played that up front, when he played as a striker, um, certainly in recent times, it's not really been in the way that in which I think he wants. I think he wants to play as a striker in a front two with Dominic yeah. Calvert Lewin. He doesn't want to play as a striker where he's sort of there and everybody else is here yeah. and it's just getting lumped up to him and the whole responsibility is on him. So I do feel for Richie a bit because I think for the last few games or so, it has, it's been the Dominic Calvert-Lewin sort of tactic, if you like, and that's lump it up to Richarlison and just hope that he can hold it up and do something with it. And Richarlison hasn't got the aerial presence that Dominic Calvert-Lewin has. He doesn't yeah. win as many aerial duels as Don does. So I do, I get it and I understand it. And I think, I, I think he worked hard on Friday, I do. I think he worked hard. Don't get me wrong. I think his finishing was poor. I think the, the one in the second half, which could have won it, was you, you have to score them. You do. But yeah. maybe he's done a little bit of what Dom's done in recent weeks and sort of seen the lights a little bit and panicked and went back instead of just leaning forward and, and slotting it. But I really don't think Richarlison's idea of playing up front is him being the lonely striker and yeah. everybody just sort of lumping it up to him. Um, he had an involvement in the second goal, I think, Sigurdsson's goal. I think he passed it to Coleman. He won yeah. two with Coleman and then Coleman lashed it in. Um, but yeah, I just don't think he's having as great as the seasons, to be honest. I, I don't. And I've got full faith and belief that he'll come back and next season he'll be even better. But I, I do think he wants to play as a striker, but I think he wants to play as a striker with Dom, where they're both playing off each other when yeah. we're playing well, rather than just him up front on his own and everybody sort of lashing it up to him. But look, you, you can't excuse missed chances and he hasn't been on great form and, and he needs to improve and his finishing needs to improve. And, and we all know that. Um, but this is a lad who, let's not forget, for the last two seasons prior to Carlo Ancelotti, he was probably the only the half decent seven player. He was the player that kept yeah. us in leagues, kept us, even though we didn't perform well and we finished 12th and we finished ninth or whatever we did in Marco Silva's first season, a lot of that was down to his goals. I think he's in the top five highest goal scoring Brazilians in the Premier League already. He's yeah. done the majority of that forever. Not just his goals in terms of <clears throat> the goals he scored, but 
think of the goals he scored. I remember Crystal Palace at home. He scored the winner against them. Mm. Now, we mightn't remember that game because it's Crystal Palace at home, but if it wasn't for him running the whole length of the pitch and burying it, which was a brilliant goal, solo goal, we wouldn't have won that game. Mm. I remember he took it around Duffy against Brighton. He won that game for us. The derby this year, you know, I know Guilfrey Sigurdsson went on to score the pen, but he set the stall out early with a brilliant finish. Um, so, I think the goals Richie scored this season have been important, but ultimately... He does fall into that bracket with Dom a little bit as that his finishing needs to improve, but he hasn't had a great season. And I imagine Richarlison have had a season like last season, this season. You yeah. Know, who knows where it would be? Well, it'll be a lot, of be a lot better because we're getting a few more goals from midfield, not nowhere near enough. Yeah. Um, I mean, you mentioned <laughs> he's frustrated, isn't he, Richarlison? He wants, to, he wants to be in that Brazilian national team. And you mentioned him playing split <laughs> striker, and he, he, he did that well last season, but I think playing as a lone striker, so I know we had Hammers playing <laughs> off him. On, on, on Friday, but playing as a lone striker, we saw him. You know, we'd have the ball out on the on the wing with Gilfie and Luke Dean. Yeah. I'd be coming, he'd be coming trying to pick it up off them, and he, it's not where he should be. So I can see the split striker yeah. thing, and I don't know exactly what you mean, but yeah, I suppose we played well. We we did look sharp. We we you know, we were getting forward, we were creating chances, but I suppose, like you said, we let ourselves down again. We're poor defending. I mean, the the second goal especially was just the first goal. I didn't quite know why. I still don't understand why holding it was on the floor. I'm guessing he just anticipated it wrong, but the second goal was just, it was Sunday League defending, wasn't it? I, I still can't get my head yeah. around it. But, yeah, yeah, it was a, it's a fair point, I suppose. I, th I think if, you, if we'd have got three points at Brighton and three points against Palace, then we'd have took a point on Friday. But I think the fact that we've took now three points out of nine games, that that game, we'd, well, it was two points out of six games at the time, so that game, you know, we, were, we were desperate for a win, really. But it's been, we've not won yeah. a game since West Brom at the start mm -hmm. of March. And it only makes us, you know, it makes the Arsenal game a must win, especially if we want Europe on, on yeah. Friday. But um, yeah, so moving on, it was a interesting couple of days after it. As, as you said, it was a bit of a whirlwind the past few days. So what was your first initial reaction when the proposed European <coughs> Super League was announced on Sunday night, was it? Yeah, Sunday yeah. night, yeah. What, what was your initial uh, reaction? It was rumoured first, wasn't it? And as soon as it was rumoured, there's all of these words, one words that we can used to describe our, <clears throat> you know, initial thoughts and feelings. We can say disgusted. The fans of those clubs might say embarrassed, ashamed. We can say annoyed, upset, frustrated. But there's one word I think that sticks out more than other that is more damning than any of the other words as well. And that's, it's not a word, but it's a phrase. Not surprised. I, I wasn't mm. surprised whatsoever. And I've said this for a while. When, when the Premier League and UEFA and all of these organisations have allowed these multi-billionaires to come in and take over football clubs with no knowledge of football whatsoever, no care in the world for the sport, the legacy of the sport, the founding mm. members of the sport, even the rules. Valentino Perez is talking about shortening games and no one under 24 likes football. What a load of nonsense that is. When you allow these people to come yeah. in and just take over football clubs, what do you expect to happen? And I seriously think... For as much as we were on UEFA side and FIFA side and the Premier League side over the last 48 hours or so, and we all were, they can't escape blame. They simply cannot escape blame. The yeah. reason as to why these billionaires have, have had the bottle to do what they've done is because those organisations have allowed them to come in. I mean, I, re I read a tweet yesterday. Um, <clears throat> I think it was from uh, Sky Sports, and it was somebody talking, and they said they know of a chairman or a high executive in one of those six clubs yeah. who when he first went to watch that club, he asked who was sitting next to him, who are we? What, what, what colour do we play in? Now, I said on our live stream yesterday, I don't know if you've seen, I said, I reckon, I'm, I'm just an Everton fan. I, I live 10 minutes down the road from Goodison, watched Everton all my life. I do business admin for the job. I don't do this sort of stuff for the job. But I reckon you could put me in front of any human being on this planet and it'd take me less than five minutes to figure out if they understand football or not, if they actually know mm. what football is about, what it means to fans, what it means to clubs to have won all of these trophies and being this successful it doesn't take uh you know a rocket scientist to sit down with someone and go you actually haven't got a clue you haven't got the best interests of this sport in hand and if the premier league would have done that 10 15 20 years ago then these people wouldn't have been allowed to come in and take over these football clubs but they didn't they just went oh my god it's, it's all about money they're going to bring loads of money and we're yeah. going to make loads of money blah 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 certain television broadcasters are the same if they'd have come out and stopped naming it the big six and the super six and all that that name has come from people like sky and bt and all of them yeah. who have named them that for years and years and years it's not come from them clubs all of them chairman have done has gone 
Well, that's what we get called by these people. So we'll just adopt mm. that name. Stop calling them the big six. They're not the big six. They're not the best six for the start because Arsenal haven't been a decent mm. footy team for about a decade. Leicester and West Ham are in the best six at the moment. And in terms of the big six, are Manchester City a big six club in terms of English football history? Spurs. No, they're not. Spurs have Spurs. never won a league title. Spurs, exactly. Spurs aren't. Certainly not in terms of European Cup history. Exactly. Arsenal. I've, yeah, Arsenal, OK, finished in, in the Champions League for loads of years on the bounce, but they finished fourth, didn't win it, didn't win the league yeah. to get in the Champions League. They haven't had any real success. I know they've won a few FA Cups, but they haven't had any real European success. Certainly not in my lifetime. So no, nobody escapes blame in this situation. The Premier League, UEFA, FIFA, all of their media companies, they all have to accept that. Do you know what? We OK, we might not have had a part to play in this European Super League, but... We've we've had the matches that have lit the fire that have that have caused this. Um and I, I hope to God that when I watch these media broadcasters and all of that, we don't get the big six or the super six anymore. They're just called clubs like everybody else is a yeah. club and they've spoken about the same, if not even worse now what they've done as the rest of um as the rest of the clubs in the Premier League. And they should be the, they should be sanctioned, they should be fined, they should be punished, they should be deducted points. They won't be. They they'll won't get, be at they'll all. They'll get welcome back with a hug, won't they? <laughs> That's it. Well, there was a rumour last night that UEFA had... Well, you, we, there wasn't even a rumour. There was rumours that UEFA had, were going to pay these clubs a lot of money to return to UEFA. Yeah. But let's just park the rumours for a moment. What we know is a mere fact is that one of the heads of UEFA, I can't remember his name, his name's Alexander Sutton, he released a statement thanking Manchester City for, for leaving the Super League. It's great to have them back. It's brilliant. It's this, it's that. We can't wait to have them back. Thank you for seeing this, that and the other. Basically... Kiss and ass, let's be honest, kiss and ass to Manchester City. Now, if this was about football and this was about football fans and how much football means to us, because let's be honest, that's what UEFA's statement was. They come out on Monday morning and said, uh, it's a spit in the face of all football lovers. The Premier League said, oh, this is it's all about football and think about the football pyramid and the, and the football league and all of these clubs. If that was genuinely their reason for being frustrated and annoyed, go out and find those clubs. But it wasn't, Ned. All as it was is for money, Matt. All as it mm. was, they were worried about how much money they are going to lose. And that's the reason why they're getting welcome back with open arms. That's the reason why they're still allowed to compete in the UEFA Champions League semi-final. How silly is that? How silly is it that UEFA are letting four mm. clubs or three clubs who turn around and said, we don't want anything to do with you anymore and signed a 147-page document agreeing to that? How silly is it that UEFA have gone, right, they've changed their mind now, so yeah, we'll let you come back in. and, and we'll, Why not take it? If it was about football and about how they've tried to ruin football, take a stance and say, no, you're not competing. We get that you've apologised and you want to come back in, sad, but you're getting punished, you're not competing. There's up them points in the league, but it's not about, it was never about that for those organisations. It was about that for us fans. We never wanted to see it because we care about football, we care about grassroots and legacy and where football's yeah. been, but it wasn't that for the Premier League, it wasn't that for UEFA. They said that in their statements, but that was just a big facade to get on the side of the fans. They may as well have come out and gone, listen, we're going to lose a crap load of money if these leave here, so we need them to not leave. Because it's not about football or the legacy, it's about the fact that they were going to lose a lot of money. Um, obviously, it's all felt to crap now as well, so it's been, it has been yeah. a whirlwind, it's been a bit mad, but yeah. Well, I don't, I don't know, mate. Well, I'm just proud as an Everton fan to be one of them clubs that stood up against it, to be honest. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I mean the statement they came out and made yesterday was a very proud moment I, every, they said what yeah. everyone was thinking and they said it first but I mean if you look at the teams that were in it initially <clears throat> I mean, look at the depth some of those clubs yeah. are in and you look at the teams yeah. currently while we're filming this there's three teams left as far as I know there's, there's Juventus Barcelona and there's Real Madrid and look at the depth <clears throat> they're in I mean people yeah. were getting arrested yeah. at Barcelona Barcelona Football Club last year weren't they or a few months ago for for ta- yeah. not paying taxes it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's a joke but if you look at the outcome of it now right They've basically got what they want. A reformed UEFA Champions League, which means they get the more chance of them pretty much guaranteed places. As yeah. look, if you look at Real Madrid and Barcelona, they've been in it since the ninth season. They've not missed a year, have they? So they're guaranteed anyway. And they get more money, so they've got what they want. But how can you let these, these club owners yeah. back into the domestic leagues when they've there's obviously a clear split now between the, the clubs in, in those leagues and I mean, they basically came out, didn't they, and said, oh, money's more important than the fans. That's what they basically said, yeah. haven't they? It's borderline yeah. psych- uh, uh, psychopathic, sociopathic, isn't it? Because they've got no remorse yeah. for anyone but their own back pocket. I mean, yeah, the, the, well, the, 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 nice, the nice thing was to see so many clubs come together and fans come, to the, come together, especially even the, the fans yeah. of those clubs that were p- proposed to, be, to join the Super League and you know, players and managers that have, have stood up against it, the captains of the Premier League, 
know, John Anderson making a statement was uh, was nice <laughs> to see. And even even politi- even MPs and the PM himself, yeah. Mister Boris Johnson, you know, seeing seeing MPs come together and um, make a stand against it. I suppose the thing with Boris Johnson was though, you know, we wanted to be the obviously they've yeah. been a get involved. Well, they're not they're not the favourite government, are they? I know they're not uh, yeah. not in a great couple of years. Um, so coming in and if if they could have got us fans, you know, behind. Them, <laughs> you know, imagine if yeah. Boris Johnson was the hero, the man who saved football. <laughs> that would have been a, something for him. But uh, in, instead, it's Gary Neville. <laughs> exactly, I mean, Gary spoke for us all on a, on Monday Night Football. He absolutely hit yeah. the nail on the head, didn't he? And uh, I think the the thing of a Klopp's interview as well, you know, it. I felt a bit sorry for him because I mean I'm not saying I'd, I'm not really a fan of Klopp, but after all everything that happened in the media and before even the clubs really said anything themselves, then they made a statement. I mean Liverpool released a statement that was fronted by United, wasn't it? Yeah. So when everything was left to Klopp and fronted to Klopp on national television, I did feel a bit sorry for him. I know obviously he's got to be careful what he says because it's yeah. you know, his job's on the line. But I mean he. he Sort of targeted Gary Neville, took it out on him, didn't he? And Gary Neville responded perfectly. But listen, I think it's... what it is, I think what it is, is nobody wanted the European Super League. Nobody yeah. wanted this Super League. The Premier League didn't want it. UEFA didn't want it. We didn't want it as fans. <laughs> and, and look, you're right. The fans of Liverpool coming out and putting banners all over Anfield was yeah. great to see. I don't like Liverpool. I, I, you know, I really, really don't like them. Obviously, I'm an Everton fan. But it was, it was great to see them with the banners and, and spreading their discuss. Chelsea fans yesterday, that sign yeah. saying we want our Stoke away. That was great to see. United fans coming out, Arsenal fans doing the same thing. But the reality of this situation is, mate, is that nobody wanted this European Super League. UEFA, FIFA, us as fans, the Premier League, uh, pundits, players, managers, etc. Nobody wanted it. But pe- th- th- it was for different reasons as to why people didn't want it. We didn't want it as fans because it was going to destroy football. I believe Gary Neville didn't want it because it was going to destroy football because now he's coming out and saying, I don't care about the fact that it's not happened. Punish those clubs, punish yeah. those teams, punish them, deduct them points, relegate them, make them start again, punish them. Um, obviously the Chelsea fans, all of us as fans, didn't want it because it was going to destroy football. Why didn't the Premier League want it? Why didn't UEFA want it? Why didn't FIFA want it? Was it for the same reasons? I personally, my personal opinion, I can only speak for myself, I don't think so. I think they didn't want it because it was going to lose them an awful lot of money because ultimately the money in football has ruined football over the last 20 years. It's a representation of the society that we live in and it's ruined football. Whether the Super League happened or not, this was just the, you know, the... um, the fire that was lit by all of the flames of the past 20 years of the money brought into football, that, that's ruined it. it. It's a ruined sport, mate. Players getting paid silly money. Um, ticket prices, people, clubs trying to put ticket prices up to ridiculous amounts of money, going into a ground and getting a free course meal. What's that, mate? I don't go to Goodison expecting a free course meal. If I get a lukewarm sausage roll, I'm happy. And if I get a pint that tastes like pig, yeah. I'm relatively happy. I just want to go and watch Everton. It's not a bougie thing to go to a football match it's not it's not a corporate thing and you know and again I, I get that these owners of these clubs want to make it more like the Super Bowl they want to make it I went to um a few years back it was in 2014 I think I went over to New York with my mum and dad and one of the things we wanted to do while we were in New York was watch a New York Yankees game watch the baseball now I've got no interest in baseball it's boring um <clears throat> but we were there for an hour and a half two hours whatever it was and I must have watched 20 minutes of baseball because there was people running on and advertising these beer companies people running on advertising telecom the stadium there was a pizza hut in the state there was genuinely people sat in a restaurant and in a pub in that in that ground or in that stadium whatever you want to call it watching the game on the telly when the game was being played outside and you would and it wasn't like you walked outside and it was a hundred thousand seat a pack you couldn't move so those people couldn't get a seat there were seats everywhere mm. and i genuinely remember thinking it's just commercial. I can look that way for the American market. I'm not having a go at baseball. I'm not having a go at the American market. That works for them, and that's what they want. Then that's fine. Yeah. But that isn't football, and that isn't football Spot in this on, country. Yeah. And nobody wants that. Nobody wants to go into Goodison Park. Same. With, I'm, I'm saying this on behalf of Everton as well. I, I don't know if anybody from Everton will listen to this, but I'm saying this on behalf of Everton. I'm not. I'm obviously I know Bramley Moor will have commercialised suites, and there'll be suites where you get a free course meal, blah blah blah. But I don't want to be walking into Bramley Moor and being offered 
you know, a, a pizza and chip meal. I don't want to be walking into Bramley Moor and feeling like I'm just a customer here. I'm just number one, two, four, six, five, two, whatever. I want to be going into Bramley Moor feeling like I feel when I go into Goodison Park. I'm a fan. I'm here to support my football club. I'm here to make a noise and to get those players on side and to, for, for winning reasons to go out and support my club, whether they win, they draw or they lose. I don't want to go in and feel like this feels like I've gone to watch a little mix at the Echo Arena or something. It's just mm. all commercialised. And unfortunately, mate, that's what football is going towards. There's, there's no surprise. Like I said, it wasn't surprising when I saw that these owners wanted to take football and go and do it. Else. No, no surprise that Florentino Perez wants to make football matches shorter. It was no surprise. And I know they brought in that water break during the lockdown for every 20 minutes they'll get a water break. They brought that in and he blagged so players can get a drink or so managers can have tactics. If players had gone, yeah, you know what? I like those breaks. They're, they're, they're decent then. We get a chance to have a drink. We get a chance to talk to the manager. By this season, if that would have gone through in it last season, by now, those breaks would have been advertised. There'd have been an advertisement every time the game stopped. This this break is sponsored by, don't know, something televisions. This break is sponsored by this coffee shop. Corners would be sponsored. This corner is sponsored by it. That's the way football is going. And that's what these have tried to do, ultimately. They've gone, we'll take this away from the fans and we'll just commercialise it and make it one big entertainment platform. I mean... No competition, no relegation, no fighting for anything. Yeah. Are we trying to make this the WWE or something and just take the sport in, in factor and just go, right, we'll just make it dead fake, but we'll make it dead entertaining. That's not footy, mate. That's not footy. That's mm. not the footy I love. That's not the footy I want to watch. And I, I'm so proud to be an Evertonian. I'm so proud that our football club, not only oh, Marcel Brands has, has extended his contract, has just come through then. Uh, yeah. That's something we can talk about in a minute. Yeah, I'm, I'm so proud to be an Everton fan and, and to be one of those clubs that stood up against it because if it, if that was Everton who done that I, I generally don't think I could be sitting here wearing the badge to be honest with you mate because I'd be disgusted yeah. I'd be absolutely disgusted well you said you said before you, you hit the nail on the head didn't you with the, with the franchise thing they wanted to make their own franchise and you've seen it in the Premier League yeah. already I'm not going to mention names but you, you know there's clubs that will they limit the amount of season ticket holders because they want <laughs> they want new people coming the match every week because they will yeah. go spend money in the shop if, yeah. if every season Seat belongs to a season ticket holder. <laughs> they don't go in the in the shop and buy a shirt every week, do they? Yeah. So they wanted exactly. to make their own Disneyland, basically, and yeah. I, I don't know how they can allow these club owners to be still in these domestic leagues when there's an ob- obvious divide, and you can't the fans the fans off their own clubs can't trust them because they 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 know that now you don't care about the fans; it's all about the money. So yeah, I mean, and, I, and look, I get I get that money is is about I get that football is about yeah, money now, yeah. and I get that you know for. For years, uh, I've spoken on clubs that released their home kit um, the day of the last game of the season so that people flood in the shops and get it. And, I, and I, there's yeah. elements of this that I don't agree with and I don't like because it's not football, but I understand that that's where football is now. I get that Ever- I'm not going to sit here and blag that and, and start sitting here and, and acting like Everton haven't got a multi-billionaire owner who's mm. putting 500 million into this club and who's likely to put in a further however many hundred million. I'm not going to sit here and say, we're dead innocents. We don't run off money. We're this, that, we're that, the other. Obviously, we spend a lot of money. Obviously, we pay footballers' wages ridiculous amounts. Obviously, we pay stupid amounts of money for players that don't end up being any decent. I get that. In terms of the wider societal problem, Everton are probably to blame. I have as much part to blame as not those big clubs because they're on a different level, but a lot of other clubs in in the country and around the world. But it's about having the models and knowing what's right and what's wrong and what's right for football. Football is is cut. It's gone past the point of no return. I said yesterday, there'll never not be money in football. Now it'll only rise unless it's capped with the salary cap or a weight or a wage cap or a transfer fee cap. The money will always rise. We will never get back to that point where footballers are purely playing for the love of the sport. They'll always be paid more money than me and you will ever think to see in our bank accounts in our lifetimes. That's just how it is. It's gone past that point where we won't, we will never go back from that now. And I get that, but that's why when Farah Mashiri came out and said what he said, I felt so proud because I thought, well, he's a billionaire owner. And as much as I understand the fans of those top six clubs or big six clubs, nonsense. I understand the fact the fans of those six clubs coming out and saying, well, you're, you weren't in that position, so you don't know what your owner has done. And when they said that on Sunday night, I sat here and thought to myself, no, Everton wouldn't do that. Everton wouldn't sell us down the river. Everton wouldn't do that. But I thought there was also an element to me that thought, well, we have got a billionaire owner, so mm. who knows? Who knows if we were invited, what the outcome would be? Who knows if, if it was Everton instead of Tottenham, what we'd be talking about today? Because it might yeah. be... That, and Farah Mercedes come out and said what he said, and it made us all proud, and it's brilliant that he said it. And that shows that Everton have an owner who, yes, is going to bring in a lot of money, and, and I understand that, but also 
cares about the values of football and the Premier mm. League, uh, not the Premier League, and the English football and league and the football and pyramid and us as fans as well. That's important. Everton have had to employ a billionaire backer to compete with those teams in the top league. Otherwise, we'd be in the Championship League one and would be would be one of those clubs. Yeah. In order to compete and to stay alongside these clubs, we've had to do what they've had to do, but we've done it in the right way and we've done it in a moral way, whereas they haven't. And, you know, again... Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> well, well, you mentioned punishment before, and obviously I'd, letting these club owners back in the domestic leagues like punishment would be a, not surprising, but, but obviously a massive... Uh, Bit of a sham, to be honest. So obviously, we've seen clubs like Wigan. I mean, the EFL let an owner who clearly doesn't know how to run a football club, I wasn't fit to run a football club, take over Wigan, and they got relegated for it. Yeah. I know Wigan aren't as big as clubs. The big six. Um, yeah. I mean, they've won more trophies recently than Tottenham, haven't they? So, <laughs> but what, 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 what do you think should happen to these big six clubs, these elite super clubs with superpowers? You just mentioned it then, mate, Barry. You know, uh, this argument of... and uh, Listen, there's two elements of this argument. Fans saying, don't punish us, it wasn't our fault. Players saying, don't punish us, it wasn't yeah. our fault. As a fan, there's an element to me that understands that. I get what they're saying. I get that fans of Liverpool Football Club have come out in their thousands, millions, whatever, same with Man United, same with Arsenal, and gone against this. They haven't wanted this. Yeah. Neither of the players, neither of mm. the, the, the manager. I get that, and I do get that from one standpoint. But what those fans have to realise is when it was Berry, did Berry fans want to go into uh, liquidation and not become mm. a football club anymore? No. Did Bolton fans want to be relegated and stuff the point because mm. of their dodgy ownership? No. Did Wigan fans want the same? No. Did uh, Leeds fans years ago want that same? No. So you have to employ the same rules for one, uh, for, for everyone as you do for, for those clubs. And ultimately... Exactly. The EFL and the Football League were very, very, very... I remember the Bolton situation. I remember the Wigan situation. It was only a couple of years ago. They were very, very quick to say, no, you, you, you can't feel the team. You're getting deducted points. That's it. It wasn't a discussion. It wasn't a, shall we do it? Shall we not do it? It was a cutthroat. No, it's getting done. That's the end of it. And as much as we all might have said, well, that's a bit harsh on them. That's not their fault. We all also sort of thought, well, that's in the rules and that's the cutthroat rules. That's what it is. They've been fined. They've been stuck the points. They've been relegated. Whatever. You have to employ the same rule with these clubs. Just because it's Liverpool, it's Manchester United, it's Arsenal, it's Chelsea, doesn't mean that they haven't broken the same rules. It's probably worse rules than those previous clubs did that were deducted 15, 20 points that were banned from leagues that were relegated automatically, that were ripped to bits. And even in the extreme circumstance of Berry, that were completely destroyed and are no longer a football club. You, the rule nine, I think it is, in the Premier League, is that no club without Premier League comp, um, without Premier League approval can go and play in any other league that's not the Champions League, Europa League, FA Club, Carabao Cup, or the leagues relegated prior to the Premier League. They've very, very clearly broken that rule. And they haven't just broken that rule. They've stuck two fingers up to you and gone, nah, I'm going to go and play in this. Yes, yeah. they regret it. Yes, they regret it, of course they do, because of the, the outrage by fans, because of the fact that... And let's be honest with ourselves, um, Matt, Roman Abramovich come out yesterday and said that I re we regret this decision, we're going to leave it. Manchester City did it. Do they regret the decision because fans have come out and, and spoke their, their minds and, and gathered and protested, etc.? Yes. But are they thinking, oh, the fans don't like this here? No, what they're thinking is, our customers don't like this. And if we go ahead with this, we're going to lose a lot of customers and therefore we're going to lose a lot of money. So it's not in our interest because that's all we are, mate. Well, I, I feel like a fan of Everton because of the way Everton have come out and read the statements and the way far that machine talk. But if I'm a Chelsea fan now, if I'm a Liverpool fan, if I'm an Arsenal fan, I just feel like a customer. And that's the reason as to why, look, Arsenal, I think, were the only group that come out and said the word apologise. Now, <clears throat> just because they've apologised doesn't make it OK, but they were the only club within their statement that said we apologise to the fans. Every other club mm. was just a generic statement. We thank our stakeholders and we move on. It's it's a nonsense. And in terms of punishment, like I said, just to get back onto the point, they, they have to be given a worse punishment than those clubs previous mentioned because they didn't try and go off and make another league. Those clubs were punished because of bad ownership and bad ownership that led them into a situation where they couldn't field the team or they couldn't play a game. These clubs should be punished for bad ownership, but on a much more severe level because those owners have tried to turn it back on the entire football pyramid and go away and make their own league. If they don't get punished, which I'm not, I, I, I'm, I'm not going to lie to you, mate, I don't think they will be punished. I really, really don't think they will be punished. And there's a reason for that. is because you punish Man United and Liverpool <clears throat> and you relegate Man United and Liverpool into the National League and say, build your way back up, then ultimately 
the Premier League loses a lot of eyes. The Premier League loses a lot of money. The Premier League loses a lot of customers. Yeah. We're not stupid here. Stop, stop making out like we're stupid. Stop coming out and saying it's about football. It's about the football pyramid. It's about that. It's not. It's about mm. money and how much money they'll lose in their pocket. Don't just come out and be honest and say, look, we're not going to deduct points on any of the teams because if we do, this big six, as much as it's a nonsense and half of the teams in there aren't even a big, big teams in terms of historical uh, trophies won certainly not in Europe but the reality is if we deduct points from these if we relegate them if we if we um you know punish them then they'll probably get the ick and we'll lose a lot of money because if they're not playing in the Premier League we don't get as many customers and, and, and that's the be all and end all so should they be punished absolutely absolutely and if they're not punished then again I, I, I I give up with football every week, to be honest. I give up with football when Everton drop points like we did the other day. But I really, truly do give up with football if, yeah. if, um, if these clubs aren't punished because it's blatantly there that it's one rule for one and one rule for another. Did they care about Berry? No, because Berry don't bring in million, billions and millions of pounds every year. Didn't with Bolton. Will he with Manchester United and Liverpool? Yeah. Have a pair of balls, go a pair of balls and go and give them a punishment mm. that they deserve. And then we can all sit back and go, do you know what? Fair play to the Premier League. But, and then if, if the Premier League do that, I'll come on here next week, Matt, or the week after, and I'll say, do you care about football? If UEFA would have come out and if they, they still got time to come out and say, do you know what? No, PSG or the champions of the Champions League, you lot can't play in it next season and we'll talk about the season after where if we if we think you deserve it, then I'll say, do you know what? UEFA care about football. But until they do that, which they won't, UEFA will let them Champions League semi-finals go ahead. Why? Because it'll make them a load of money and then the final will make them a load of money and the Premier League will let these teams come back in. I mean, it was... On Sky Sports yesterday, when when Chelsea were playing, um, I can't remember whether it was Alan Smith or somebody, somebody that was against the Super League and, and come out and openly admitted to be against the Super League. Um, just before the Chelsea game, said because obviously it was leaked that Chelsea were going to leave. Yeah. Oh, it's uh, it's all back on now. Um, you know Chelsea have finally got something to fight for. They've got a fight for top four. These players have got their their um, you know they've got their, their fight for top four back on. And I was like. Well, why? Why should they have a mm. fight for top four? All as the Sky Sports then have done is rubbed that under the carpet and gone, oh yeah, it doesn't matter now because they're out of it. So mm. the fight for top four is back on. Why should the fight for top four be back on? Why should those clubs be allowed to compete in Europe when they've just walked yeah. away from UEFA? Grow a pair, Premier League and UEFA and FIFA, grow a pair and punish these clubs. And I get that. It's not fair on the players and the fans. And I get it. If it was Everton, I'd probably be sitting here saying, it's not that fair on us, is it? Because we've not done anything as a fan base. But it doesn't matter. It wasn't fair on Berry fans. It wasn't fair on Bolton fans. Punish the clubs. Yeah, well, listen, we're getting we're getting new information all the time now. We're still sort of in the middle of it. I mean, I can't... I won't be surprised if we don't punish them anyway. But listen, yeah. the, at the end of the day, the owners have got exactly what they want. They've got a new... Um, reformed UEFA for Champions League, which is looking like the likely outcome, and might be the probably the best possible outcome if you look back on Monday. What we're all thinking, but I said yeah. it's not exactly what we want. It's not great for us, but I suppose it could be a lot worse. But moving on in terms of information, we've had some new information breaking just as we're recording this. What's uh, what's been going down in Everton? So um, yeah, Everton Aff have just clicked on my phone then to see if anyone's anything's happening. And the Everton Aff have said that Everton have, uh, have extended the contract of Marcel Brands, the club's director of football. So I haven't read the full story, but uh, that's the latest. Again, not, not no surprise on the Marcel Brands yeah. uh, front. He's a member of the board. Um, I think the reason as to why it's only just being announced is because they probably weren't really worried about it or weren't really thinking about it. In fact, it's probably at the bottom of the pile because they thought, yeah, he'll just get the paper out and sign it. Um, there's a lot of worry. I don't know why, but there seems to be a lot of worry within fans as to whether or not he's signed. Why hasn't he signed yet or not? Yeah. Probably because the club are thinking transfers, the league, European football, mm. all of that will be above the the, the uh, evidentiality. If that's the word, the evidentiality mm. that Marcel Brand signs his, his new contract, and he, and he has done today. Um, and yeah, now now we kick start and we go go again in the summer with with him and, and Carlo Ancelotti. Well, yeah, I suppose. I know there's been not not so, not a split, but I know some fans aren't too happy with it. I mean, the, the I mean the first couple few years he's been here now, his his job's really been, you know, to trim the trim the team down and get some of the players out the door. Which obviously January did a good job of that. So whether you're happy with that or not, but I mean the players he's he's brought in so far, some have worked, some some haven't. I mean a lot of the players, especially some of our best players, have been down to the manager. Really, look at Richarlison with Michael Silver and players like Hammers and Allen and then players he has brought in like Gomez and obviously Wolby we had a plan for Wolby hasn't worked out whether it was a last minute panic thing same with King really whether that was a last minute panic thing and we needed a striker and then players like Gomez Gomez hasn't worked out and but listen at the time we wanted him really didn't we so yeah. he's, if, if he's, is it three, three year deal yeah 
Yeah. If we sign a three year deal, then he's basically we're halfway through. He's got plays out the door, not much time to get plays in, I suppose. So for me, it's, it's got to be looking at those plays like we some of the plays we missed out. And this summer, there's plays out there like Leon Bailey and you know Baku or even Max Aaron's the plays that he's got to go. I mean, he did a good job with Godfrey, a young, hungry player. So I'm split on the decision. I'm not too sure, but I'd, obviously, she said we'll have to wait and see. Wait until you see the summer. So, uh, what do you expect from Marcel Brands? Are you are you happy with the with the deal? Um, yeah, I think I am. To be honest, obviously another three year contract. He's three years in, so he's halfway through effectively, as you said. Um, I think a lot of his time at Everton so far has been certainly since Carlo Ancelotti has come in has been trying to tim the squad. I mean, Marcel Brands has already tim the squad quite drastically since he's come in. I think it went yeah. from forty odd players to maybe. 30 odd play at uh, 25 play something like that and the, the value increased so in terms of a business matter i think the club are very clearly happy with marcel brands it didn't take the club very long to appoint him to the directors um to the board of directors as well and to the to the board yeah. so it's very clear that <clears throat> everton as a club are happy with marcel brands and like i said from a sheer business side of it to trim a squad of players and increase the value of that squad, even when trimming it, just shows that he's doing a good job in that sense. In mm. terms of players he's brought in, look, I think he's made some mistakes. Obviously, everybody makes some mistakes. He, he brought, I remember he brought in Fabian Delph, and it's difficult to talk about Fabian Delph and Marcel Brands because we can very clearly sit here and say, yeah, he's been an awful sign, and why did we bring him in? Yeah, he's we were happy at has... the time, though, weren't we? We thought, <laughs> That's it. nine million, he's, a, he's good for the dressing room, good character. Mm. He's just turned out to be not a... A very great signing, has he? But That's it. Same with Gomez. Right. Gomez had a first great season on loan, and then we signed him. We were all happy with it. We've said, go and get him, don't let him go to Tottenham, and it's just not worked out. That's it. And, uh, and yeah, that's uh, exactly you know, what I was, I was, uh, was going to say in terms of Delph. I think, like you said, I remember when Delph was announced, and I sort of thought, yeah, get him, won a Premier, won mm. Premier League, yeah, got exactly. that leadership. I think documentary had just come out, so you could see that he was quite a, a, a strong member, or at least a yeah, strong member of that character. Manchester City team, big character. And I was thinking, £9 million, pounds, he might just bring that leadership. We all knew he wasn't the greatest footballer, but he might just bring that leadership, maybe a Phil Neville-esque leadership that we need into this squad. And he hasn't, mm. he spent 99% of his time on the injury bed. The other rest of it, he spent arguing with fans and he's been a, a shopping signing. But we weren't sitting there when we haven't signed Fabian Delph saying that's a shocking signing that I can't believe exactly. we've done that. Yeah. We were sitting here saying 8 million, not too much. He hopefully will bring in the leadership, might be a decent player. Um, the award we won, again, I think it's more of a sign than where there was more scratch steads when it happened and then look, Awobi hasn't been a success at the club so far. And I, I agree with with you. I think there's, there was a plan for Alex Awobi, um, and it just hasn't worked out. I think maybe the club put a bit too much trust in Alex Awobi and, and what he could potentially achieve. And look, he's still young and who knows if he stays on at the club, he might he might still be able to achieve good things. Um, but there's been a lot of other players that Marcel Brands has brought in that ultimately... Um, look like top top players for the future ben goffrey being one of them ben goffrey yeah. doesn't sign without marcel brands and he's been absolutely excellent you could argue he's been our player of the season this season and um, even going through the, the the lads that are currently out on loan jared brantway mm, yeah. come in um, the last nine games of last season was, was fantastic now out on loan at blackburn had some up good time but dire bad times but looks like a really really good player for the future now in kunku who come in and has been impressive when he's played albeit he hasn't played an awful lot um like you said in terms of some of the first team, as you look at all of the first team as we signed this summer, I think Abdullah the Core was a brand sign. Um, mm. <clears throat> and, you know, he's had a positive impact. Alan, obviously, and James were, were, were Carlo Ancelotti signings um, in the same way as that Richardson was a, a Marcel Brand signing. But Luca Dean coming through through Marcel Brands, I believe Yeri Mina was through Marcel Brands. Mm. Um, you know, uh, like you said, we brought in Andre Gomez, who, OK, hasn't worked in the long run, but had a really good season on loan. Yeah. So, let's put it this way. If, if Everton wouldn't have signed Andre Gomez after that loan season um, and then signed another midfielder who wouldn't have worked, we'd all still be sitting here saying, why didn't we just go and sign Andre Gomez when he was on loan? So, we did. We made that sign. And again, I remember sitting here when we signed him for £20 million, and I was ecstatic. I was over the moon. Mm, yeah. I thought, get him. We've got a brilliant player in. He's in on a permanent. He's committed. And he was great on loan last season. You know, has it worked out? <clears throat> no, it hasn't. But that's, I suppose that's all part and parcel of being a director of football. Isn't it? Everton could go out tomorrow and sign Lionel Messi and we'd all be sitting here going, oh my God, we've signed Lionel mm. Messi. Lionel Messi could come in next season, score 50 goals and Everton win the league. Or he could do absolutely nothing, argue with fans, and we'd all be sitting here saying, why did we go out and sign Lionel Messi? But when mm. we signed then we all said, oh my God, think of what could happen. So don't get me wrong, he's, he's brought in some bad players. Um 
or he's, he's made some bad signs for the money that was spent yeah. put it that way. Um, but even the likes of Moiskeen, who hasn't worked, will make a profit on Moiskeen. So mm. just from a sheer financial business side of it, okay, he might not work as a footballer, but if we make a profit then and, and just sort of scratch the name off the list, then you know it, it's worked in terms of bringing in a player he hasn't even really played that much and then selling them on for a profit. So I, I think I'm happy with it. Um, for me, this summer, whether Marcel Brand signed a new contract or not, whether Everton finish in Europe or not, this summer is, is massive now. It really, really is. Because yeah. if we don't finish in Europe this season, next season is an absolute must. If we do finish in Europe this season, then obviously we have to improve the squad drastically because it's not good enough to play in Europe. So this summer for me will, will be very, very telling with, with Brands and, and Carlo Ancelotti. We have... We've got sort of the nucleus of a team. We brought in the likes of Ben Goffrey. I'd like to see a lot more Ben Goffrey-esque players, i.e. young players with hunger and a lot to improve, as well as a lot of quality. And then we added that extra bit of quality with with Hammers and, and Alan. Um, so I think we need another four, five, six players of that quality. Hopefully a Max Adams, and hopefully a right winger, um, and hopefully a couple of more players that have got a long future ahead of them and have got something to prove and, and, and something to um, achieve at the football club. But look, I... I I personally think it's good news. I get why some people wouldn't think it's good news, and I get why some of people have their reservations. But as you said before, stability-wise, it's it's yeah. you know, if we'd have if Marcel Brands had walked the, at the end of the season, and we'd have had to sign another director of football, it effectively it'd be the same. Wouldn't be the same, but it'd be a very similar scenario as if Carlo Ancelotti was sacked. Now we'd go right back to a five-year plan, and we'd be at year one. It'd be a little bit different because we'd still have the manager and the players, but effectively that last three years will have just been swiped and we'll go back to day one. And who knows, yeah. Marcel Brands and Carlo might have talked about the players they want and said, yeah, we'll bring in Max Adams, we'll bring in this player, we'll bring in that player. Whereas a new director of football might have come in and went, no, I want to go and sign, you know, I don't know. Um, I don't know. Cristiano Ronaldo's cousin or yeah. something because he's Cristiano Ronaldo's cousin. Um, so, yeah, adding the stability, it's a good thing. I get people's reservations, I understand that. But ultimately... It's a big, big summer now for, for Marcel Brands, and he's got the contract, and he's got to go and prove it now. Yeah, that's the thing, isn't it? You mentioned stability. It, it, it is important bringing stability to the club. There's no point bringing in new staff now and changing things around. Get, you know, give him time. He's got players out the door now. It's time for bringing players in. But uh, yeah, there you go. Marcel Brands signed a new contract. And uh, moving on to the Arsenal game this Friday, are you feeling confident? It's a big game, I suppose. It's a super elite, <laughs> super powered team with. All the money in the world, but um, listen, the last three games we've been, well, the last, probably since West Brom, to be honest, we've not been the greatest team. We've had a few games, let ourselves down, like wow. the Palace, Brighton, we couldn't better, I mean, even Tottenham, you know, made the game to win them, we let ourselves down with poor defending. So, it, for me, this is a must win game, especially if you want Europe this season. Yeah. Arsenal haven't been great, have they? Especially, you know, if you drop points against Fulham at home last week. So, is this a, a must win game for you? Are you feeling confident? Um, I am. I am feeling confident, to be honest, purely on the basis that I think Arsenal's players and, and maybe manager will feel a little bit betrayed by the club in terms of that, what's happened the last uh, few days or so. But ultimately, the frustrating thing with Everton is, and it's always the frustrating thing with Everton, it's the same every year, is that we looked at the Tottenham game, which was disappointing. And um, obviously, we, we threw it ourselves and we gifted them their goals and, and we didn't take our chances. But then you look at that and you think, well, if we'd have performed like that against Brighton, we'd have won that game quite comfortably. Mm. If we'd have performed like that against Palace, we'd have won that game. But we didn't. We sat off, we sat back, we allowed them teams to get something out of it. And then the game that we actually stepped into and we stepped forward uh, and we actually pressed the team and we got out of the team, we made two stupid mistakes and allowed the most clinical striker in the league to, to score the goals. Yeah. So... I hope Everton come out and, and adopt that same style for, for Arsenal as we did against Tottenham, where we step forward and we actually get at them, whether we will or not. As well, we'll have to wait for Carlos press conference tomorrow to determine who's fit and who's not fit and who's whether Calvert Lewin's back and or if he's not. Um, but I am feeling confident, to be honest with you, mate. I just I, I think even taking away everything that's gone on in football recently, I don't think Arsenal are the best team by by a country mile. I think they're quite poor. I think Lacazette might be out injured. Um, you know, they've got, I think they've got a shaky defence at the best of times. So, this is a game that Everton must look to win. We have to win. If we've got any aspiration of Europe now, which, again, depending on whether these clubs get sanctioned or, sorry, get punished or whatever, um, let's say the likely situation is none of them get punished and it just gets swept under the carpet. I don't know whether Europe's maybe a little bit too far of a step in front, but if the belief's still there by the players, let's go out and show that belief, go out and show that. 
fight that. Listen, Carlo Ancelotti is going to come out either way tomorrow in his press conference and say, yeah, we still believe. So go and show that belief. And if you've got a genuine belief, you beat Arsenal. Because as much as they might think they're a super big, massive, ultimately brilliant club, mm. they're not. They're a mid-table Premier League club at best. They're not a good club. Great. They're not, sorry, they're a mid-table Premier League team at best. They're not a good team whatsoever. Mm. So go out and, and show that and go out and beat them. Um, because we've got more than enough quality to do so. I'm a confident. No, because we haven't won in, in three games. Um, and in all three of those games, <clears throat> except Brighton, where we didn't have a chance, to, certainly Palace and Tottenham, we had a lot of chances we didn't take. Tottenham game was a lot better. You know, the goals, Guilfi Sigurdsson's second goal was unbelievable. Um, but we've now got to go out and win, and win this game now. It's been too long since we've won. Well, go on, to finish off then, what's your score prediction? Oh, I hate doing these. I hate doing these. Well, didn't I, didn't I get the Tottenham I'm game sure, right last week? I'm sure you got it right. I'm sure you said 2-2. <laughs> Um, I'm gonna go with I'll go with two one Everton tight, but enough to get us over the line, beat them, and then hopefully give us that little bit of confidence and momentum for the last however many games of the season. I can't even remember how many games there is left now. It but it just feels very dry, doesn't it? Football, I, football, it's, it's ironic. This time last year, not this time last year. Um, but you know, at this point in the season last year, we were all sitting there going. Oh, it's football's been suspended for the last however many months. Is there really a yeah. point in playing these games? It, what, what's in it for anybody? It just seemed like we were going through the motions. And I do feel like the remaining however many games are going to feel like that now because of everything that's gone on. And if it does get swept under the carpet, the majority of certainly those top six clubs and even the 14 clubs will probably be sitting there going, well, what's the point? You know, if, if people can just go and do what they've done and, not, and get away with it, what's yeah. the point? So it's going to be very difficult for F and any team to get motivation, I think. Uh, after this, certainly players and managers because they've been thrown under the bus as well. Uh, but hopefully Everton have got have got that motivation. I just thought we don't become complacent. I'm <clears throat> I'm gonna go with a a one nil Everton win. Come Take on, that. I'm feeling feeling confident. They they're not they're not offensively great, but we're not scoring a lot of goals, and they're not great at going forward either, are they? They yeah. watched them against Liverpool, and they just couldn't get the ball up the pitch. They got them out ball. So I'm gonna go with a one nil. Everton, we've been we've been all right away. Well, we've been brilliant away this season, haven't we? Really, only three, three defeats. So, absolutely. Yeah, I'm gonna be positive. I'm pr- probably gonna go the other way, miss off your pitch because of reverse psychology. <laughs> but you know, so yeah, Either there you way go. You win, then. Yeah, exactly. It's a win-win situation. So yeah, there you go. Thank you very much, Cameron, for joining me again. If you want to go check out Cameron's channel, The Mighty Blues, on YouTube. Thank you very much for watching this Toby TV podcast or listening if you're listening on on audio and. Uh, if you want more videos, exclusive videos, including live exclusive videos every day, I said before, it's literally cheaper than a, than a Big Mac, then join us on Patreon at Toffee TV. And uh, yeah, thanks for watching and see you later.